The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled A Targeted Approach to Management of Generalized Myasthenia Gravis, the latest on novel therapies that improve patient outcomes. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash VZG860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Today we have a very uh, in-depth program targeted approach to the management of generalized myasthenia gravis. And my name is Chip Howard. I'm a neurologist at the University of North Carolina, and I will be your moderator. Uh, tonight's panelists will also include Amy Clark, uh, one of the nurses involved in the administration of therapeutics for myasthenia, and Stephanie Iyer, uh, a PharmD at my institution uh, who is the bread and butter and keeping us out of trouble with all the therapeutics that we use. Um, we're going to begin, and we're going to break this up into several sections to give you aspects of various components in the diagnosis, management, etc., of myasthenia. And we're going to begin by addressing the burdens of disease and the burdens of treatment. And they're different. When we speak of burdens of disease, we're talking about the impact of weakness itself and what it does to visual quality, to strength, their ability to enjoy life uh, through sports or to work, etc. But we also are recognizing that there's a burden of treatment, um, the adverse event profiles, the logistics of being treated, etc. And we believe and we're increasingly that that's as important or more important. So for those who you don't know, and many of you do know, Myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disorder, uh, complement mediated, B cell dependent, and modulated by our T cell immune system. And it's very complex and intertwined and much more complex than many of our other autoimmune diseases. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Its diagnosis is clinical, it's symptom recognition, and for that reason, many folks go undetected for an indeterminate period of time, uh, which is not great. Uh, we confirm that clinical impression through immunological testing, um, electrophysiological testing, and pharmacological testing in some instances. It's due to the fact that bindings bind to various proteins at the neuromuscular junction, most commonly 80, 83, 84% to the acetylcholine receptor complex, and we have other targets in there as well that I'll discuss with you. It's a rare disease. Uh, it's not ultra rare, but rare, and most clinicians who go through training have never seen a case. Uh, we tend to collect them at my institution, and our house staff see probably too many cases, as they tell me. Uh, but eight to 10 cases per million, with about 150 to 250 cases per million in terms of prevalence. We estimate there are about 60,000 here in the U.S. Um, so it is, as I said, a rare disease. It often presents uh, with involvement of eye muscles, and any muscle you can control is fair game for this disease. It doesn't affect uh, those muscles that are under autonomic control, like bowel, like bladder, although one can have those symptoms due to other reasons. Uh, from involvement of external sphincters, but it involves bulbar or pharyngeal musculature, facial expression. Um, in the classic myasthenic facies is an individual who when you crack a joke, they snarl at you because the medial part of the lip elevates, the sides of the cheek retract horizontally rather than elevating, so they look like they're really mad at you when in fact they're not. Um, but also respiratory, limb and neck muscles. Again, anything is fair game. And about 70, 80 percent, more towards 80, have generalized disease. A small number remain restricted to the muscles of eye movement and the eyelid, um, but um, they then go on in, in virtually all cases uh, to involve the limbs as well, the bulbar, and we call that generalized myasthenia as opposed to restricted ocular disease. The core symptoms are this fluctuating weakness. 
It's made worse by activity, improved with rest only to recur when the activity was resumed. First reported by Sir Thomas Willis. He was an anatomist in the mid 1600s. And he talked about this woman who could speak real, freely and readily enough, but under an hour she became as mute as a fish, the fatigable muscle weakness of this disease. And then his observation was, nor could she recover the use of her voice under an hour. And that's the recovery phase that we see uh, with rest. And this clinical characteristic is the sine qua non of the disease, and no other disease will do that. Um, many folks, uh, 60 to 80 percent, present with either a droopy eyelid or eyelids and double vision. Uh, and it fluctuates. They may wake up fine. As the day goes on, they become symptomatic. Uh, and then over the course of time, usually within two hours, spread to involve other uh, muscle groups. The bulbar muscles may be difficulty chewing, uh, and it may be hard foods, a steak, a hamburger, celery, lettuce, very difficult to chew. And in worse cases or more severe cases, it may be grits um, and soft foods. Uh, and again, it has this fluctuating nature. Uh, they have difficulty swallowing or nasal regurgitation or coughing after they swallow because they're aspirating, micro-aspiration. And uh, we already spoke about the facial expression that may be involved. And their limb weakness very often is arms and legs, and it may vary which is more severe. Uh, and again, they start the day fine and it goes on. In many individuals, they'll also have weakness distally. And so as they climb stairs because they have a foot drop, they'll stub their toe on the riser and fall or on uneven terrain will catch their toe and fall or have difficulty maintaining a grip. Uh, or if they're typing, they find that as they type, they start to increase their mistakes because their fifth finger, fourth finger can't reach those keys to the outside. Uh, and again, if they rest, it recovers only to come back. Um, and then a significant number, and the percentages vary, develop respiratory weakness. In some instances, as exertional dyspnea. In other instances, it's frank respiratory failure uh, that requires mechanical ventilation, assisted ventilation. In those individuals who do get intubated, we call that a myasthenic crisis. We often hear the term myasthenic crisis being applied to individuals who don't end up on a ventilator, and that's wrong. Uh, crisis is only those who need ventilatory support. We classify our patients, and this uh, classification scheme originated out of the University of Virginia by Dr. T.R. Johns back in the mid to late 70s. Um, in class one, there's those who just have involvement of eye. And then two, three, and four are mild, moderate, severe, and we subclassify them into A or B. In A, they have predominant limb weakness, or B, they have predominant bulbar weakness or pharyngeal weakness. And we do that because our management strategies are different um, based on the distribution of weakness, the rapidity of onset of weakness, their pattern of weakness. And then class five, as I said, is the necessity of a respiratory intubation. And we've added uh, recently class zero because some of our management strategies have gotten good uh, that we can now put individuals into clinical remission, uh, whether or not they're on drugs or not. And so we've added class zero to signify that. As I said, there are uh, different antibodies predominantly to the acetylcholine receptor. We call those ACHR positive uh, patients. We have another target that we find in about seven to 10%, and that's to the muscle-specific protein kinase protein, musk, as we call it. They look a bit different. They tend to have weakness as well as atrophy of the muscles that surround the orofacial region, the tongue, the neck, uh, the face itself. And they're found in about seven to 10%. Um, and then we have other subgroups that have been identified. One is to LRP4, uh, another is to Agrin, though we're not completely sure if that's truly pathogenic. And then we have those that are seronegative, which means we haven't been smart enough to find the antibody yet, because virtually all of these are antibody mediated. 
it's important that we differentiate which antibody they have or don't have because management strategies are uh, linked to that. For instance, musk patients do not respond well and may be highly allergic, and I put that in quotes, to cholinesterase inhibitors. Um, they don't respond to complement inhibition, um, whereas ACH-PAR positive patients uh, will do so. So this graphic is taken from uh, Niels Gilhus, who's in Bern, Sweden, Switzerland, um, who has extensive experience uh, with the disease. And this is his cartoon of the neuromuscular junction. Uh, in the upper portion of the screen, uh, this is the nerve terminal. These are vesicles of, of acetylcholine, the neurotransmitter. There are about 10,000 molecules of transmitter per vesicle. They merge and release their contents into the synaptic space, which is here in purple, and then float across this very infinitesimally small space to bind to these red acetylcholine receptors. The receptor is a pentamere. There are five subunits. Two are identical, what we call the alpha subunit, and there are two binding sites. And both binding sites must be occupied for that ionic channel to open, then resulting in a flux of sodium predominantly, then uh, later uh, potassium, that allows an electrical charge to build within the muscle membrane. And if that electrical charge reaches a threshold, an action potential is generated, which then allows contraction of the muscle. If one or none are occupied, that receptor doesn't fire. And of the tens of thousands that are on the surface uh, of the, uh, the um, neuromuscular junction, um, then we get weakness. Now, as you can see in this cartoon, the junction is, interestingly, from an architectural perspective, it has peaks and valleys. And at the tops of the peaks are where these receptors live, not down here in the clefts. Uh, and this is designed by nature uh, to increase the density of receptors that we can pack on a membrane. If this were simply a flat sheet, we'd end up with about 30 to 40% of the number that we would have otherwise. And then we have other proteins. One can see here musk protein, and here's LRP4 next to it in this lime green, and in purple is agrin. So what do they do? Well, musk protein tells these receptors where to line up. And these receptors line up directly under the release zones of transmitter from the nerve terminal, the presynaptic nerve terminal. Uh, LRP4 tells musk to turn on, and agrin tells LRP4 to turn on to tell musk. So there's whole family of proteins that interact. Uh, and that's how we get this to go. So let's uh, move on and let's talk about some setting personalized management goals uh, from a patient or with the patient perspective. And I'd like to ask Amy Clark to take over and do this. Thank you. All right, first we're gonna talk about the goals of treatment for per the International Consensus Guidance for the Management of Myasthenia Gravis. The MGFA for, force post-intervention status classification uh, requires minimal manifestation status or better, meaning the examples are no symptoms or functional limitations due to myasthenia gravis, but some muscle weakness or on examination. Uh, Treatment-related adverse events are absent or mild, and remission is defined as no signs or symptoms of myasthenia gravis, weakness of the eyelids, closure is accepted, but no weakness of other muscles on careful examination. So patient case, uh, this is a 60-year-old man with poorly controlled ACHR-positive myasthenia gravis. In 2014, he was diagnosed with myasthenia gravis, initially treated with azathioprine, 150 milligrams daily. In 2015, he had a thymectomy with minimal response, prednisone considered but not used because of diabetes mellitus, and his BMI of 48.4 kilograms per meter squared. Patient assessment of their treatment. 
An online study conducted by the Myasinia Gravis News, the end of 790, I'm sorry, 743 respondents, 90% of whom had Myasinia Gravis. Among the respondents with Myasinia Gravis, 71% were extremely or somewhat satisfied with their treatment plan. Uh, you can see here 27.44% extremely satisfied by the big smile with teeth, 43.86 were some point, somewhat satisfied, 14.08 were neither satisfied nor dissatisfied, they're like meh, 11.91 some point, somewhat satisfied or dissatisfied, I'm sorry, somewhat dissatisfied, and then 2.71 were extremely dissatisfied. He has big eyebrows. Um, only 44% were very or somewhat satisfied, and I'm not going to read these all, but you can see that it ranged from 13 to 14% very satisfied through 30 to 31% somewhat satisfied, 10% neutral, 29% somewhat unsatisfied, and 17% very unsatisfied. Patient assessments of their treatment. Most commonly reported symptoms included fatigue at 13.34%, swallowing issues at 8.16%, impaired posture or balance at 7.34%, 6.7% had changes in speech, and then 37.94% of respondents identified fatigue as the myasthenia gravis symptom that most affected their daily life. 31.85% of those patients identified fatigue as the most bothersome adverse event of their treatment. So shared decision-making is something that's talked about quite frequently, and I'd like to get Dr. Iyer and Dr. Howard's thoughts on how, as we make the initial determination to start a patient on therapy for myasthenia gravis, do we include them in that process? Do we encourage their participation? Do we help them explore and compare the options that are out there for them? Assessing what their individual preferences are and values and goals for treatment, as well as helping them reach the decision that is best for them. And then that kind of feedback or evaluation loop that happens. A large part of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis um, is counseling patients on different medication options. So many times a physician like Dr. Howard will, will come to me and say, hey, Stephanie, we're thinking about potentially starting this patient on these two or three medications. Can you call and speak to them and um, go over the medications with them and then see what they think? Um, so then I'll give the patient a call, talk through all of the point, important points with them, and then I kind of turn it over that, to them and say, what are your thoughts or what questions do you have for me? So that way it gives them kind of an open forum to really ask questions uninhibited and, and also express concerns. That's really important. So I talk through those things with them and um, if they're ready to make a decision at that point, then we you know move forward. But I also let them know it's okay to, to take a little bit of time, think about it, talk it over with your family members and then we can revisit maybe in a week or so. So that's just kind of an example of what I do. When it comes to intravenous therapy, since we're, that's what we're discussing at the most here, what are their biggest concerns? Mm -hmm. I would say definitely travel. Um, you know, I, I do see a lot of patients that are from all across, not only North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, and Tennessee, and um, they may not have an infusion center that's close to them. So that's certainly something that we talk about, and also frequency of infusion. So. If they have to go to the infusion center very frequently, that may be not a medication that, that they may be interested in, or maybe that's not a, a barrier for them. They may not mind that at all. Um, cost is something that we talk about a lot, um, but also side effects too, kind of what to expect the day of infusion and afterwards. So I would say it ranges. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Howard, anything to add? Yeah, no, it's very critical that this be a shared experience. And our job is to lay out the pros and cons of the medications that we would consider. And in most instances, they'll ask, well, what would you recommend? And I'm very frank. I'll say in my experience, this would be best, but these are the pros and the cons and the limitations and your responsibilities as a patient. If we're using some cytotoxic therapy, they're going to need blood work on a periodic basis and they have to be a part of that. And and they have to come to the decision that yes, I am comfortable, uh, this is what I wanna do, because if it's not, if it's pushed on them, they'll often not follow advice, and those are the patients who get into trouble. So 
leading into that, of course, we have other areas that we're looking at, cultural competence in our ability to provide care. Is there a patriarchal component to the patient relationship? Are there gender um, hierarchies? Uh, are there pronouns related to their gender identity um, or um, ways that they would like us to interact with them. The care that they're expecting to receive, it can be very different based on from patient to patient, as well as how involved they are collaboratively and those other specialists that they might be seeing for other comorbidities. And then most importantly, I think, is communication and how we all as a multidisciplinary group communicate the issues of the patient with one another so that the treatment is as seamless as possible. Um, when I look at bringing a patient home on home infusion therapy, which is where my swim lane is, I look at their own goals for health. Uh, is it a therapy they're going to administer independently? Is the nurse going to come for every dose? How comfortable are they with the process? Do we reiterate, reiterate that, in, that education with pharmacy and nursing to help shore up what they understand? any barriers that they might have to adherence or capabilities, and then watching their changes from baseline, making sure they understand it's not only always a linear process, but that they give feedback on when they have those ups and downs to help us better tweak that therapy. And then going back to that feedback loop, following up with them. All right, I'm gonna give it back to Dr. Iyer and Dr. Howard. So, Having set the stage, let's sort through various treatment options, novel versus additional therapies. And I'd like Stephanie Iyer to take over and do this portion. Thank you so much. Um, so when we talk about conventional approaches to treating myasthenia gravis, we have four kind of buckets that I think of. Um, so that includes symptom control medications, thymectomy, steroids, and then our steroid sparing therapies. So first I want to mention our symptom control medication, and really that's going to be pyridostigmine, which is an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. Um, it's an oral medication, um, so it comes as a tablet, but also come as a solution. Um, there's also an intravenous solution, um, which I do want to call your attention to the dose conversion. Um, so you'll notice that here, the dosing conversion of the intravenous solution is actually 1 30th of the tablet uh, dose. Um, speaking just kind of anecdotally, we did have a patient recently who, because of various issues or you know various, various things that happened, their dose conversion was actually missed when they were being transferred from tablet to intravenous solution. And that patient did experience a cholinergic crisis. So um, just speaking from experience, that's definitely something important to be able to, um, to communicate to all members of the healthcare, healthcare team. Adverse effects um, can include diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and um, kind of increased salivation. Those are the things that I see most. However, those um, are usually dose dependent. The next uh, kind of treatment we I would like to mention is going to be thymectomy. Um, so not all patients are candidates for thymectomy, and it's certainly a discussion that the patient should have with their treating provider. Um, patients that have a thymoma or thymic hyperplasia, of course, would be most important for them to receive a thymectomy. However, even patients that don't have one of those two things could potentially have one completed. Um, but again, best decision to be made with their treating provider. Thymectomies are not curative uh, for myasthenia gravis, um, but it can allow patients to um, have a reduction in their symptoms and also be um, better responders to therapy. Steroids, of course, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about steroids for a little bit. Um, so most commonly, that, that's going to be prednisone, um, oral prednisone that we often cap around 60 milligrams daily. Um, of course, adverse effects are plentiful, which I'm sure you're also very familiar with. Weight gain, hyperglycemia, osteoporosis, ocular effects, those are the main ones that, that we tend to see. Um, and for this reason, we do try to titrate down their dose of prednisone um, as quickly as it can to make sure that's appropriate. Um, so that way they're on their lowest dose um, possible to try to avoid a lot of these adverse effects. 
And so now, lastly, um, kind of getting into steroid sparing therapy. So we do have some oral medications, um, azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, cyclosporin, methotrexate, um, mycophenolate, and tacrolimus. But then we also have some IV infusion options, so our IVIG and our rituximab. I did want to pull out three specific medications, the azathioprine, IVIG, and mycophenolate, as these are the most commonly used medications here in the United States, but um, worldwide, the distribution or use of these therapies is certainly varied. Um, I do want to call out mostly the adverse effects. Azathioprine and mycophenolate do have very common, um, or adverse effects kind of in common, the bone marrow suppression and uh, GI toxicity. Um, for IVIG, most importantly is the hypersensitivity reactions, um, renal dysfunction, and thromboembolic events. So for this reason, um, any patients that have kidney dysfunction should not, be, should not use IVIG um, and thromboembolic events. So any sort of past medical history of clots, or if they are currently on an anticoagulant, um, they would not be a candidate for IVIG. With all of the recent research that has gone into myasthenia gravis treatment, we have a new category of medications um, classified as immunotherapies. So our complement inhibitors and our FCRN antagonists are gonna be our medications that fit within this category. The first is complement inhibitors. Um, so the picture on the slide is a great representation of what happens when complement is activated uh, within, within the body and at the neuromuscular junction. So starting at the left-hand portion of the slide, um, or sorry, the picture, um, you'll see that the uh, antibodies will bind to the acetylcholine esterase receptors, and that causes activation of the complement cascade, leading to formation of this membrane attack complex, or MAC. So when that happens, um, the destruction of the morphology of that muscle membrane at the neuromuscular um, junction at the postsynaptic location will become degraded um, and actually prevent neuromuscular transmission. So this is what we're targeting with our complement inhibitors, preventing this whole process from happening. There are three complement inhibitors I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, eculizumab and rabulizumab are very similar, so I'll kind of talk about those together. And then Zylucoplan, um, which has a planned submission to the FDA this year, um, is slightly different. So eculizumab and rabulizumab, um, they both uh, kind of classically prevent that complement protein um, from forming and that formation of the MAC complex. Um, they're both, of course, IV infusions. Um, eculizumab is dosed every other week as in terms of its maintenance dosing, but then the maintenance dose for rivalizumab is every eight weeks. Um, their adverse events are very similar, or uh, adverse effects are very similar. Um, both require vaccination for meningococcal um, and then headache um, and potential infusion related reaction. For Zylucoplan, the mechanism is slightly different. So it does um, have a protein that binds specifically to C5 and C5B. So that is one difference between uh, the eculizumab and rapilizumab that I mentioned before. Zylucoplan is also a sub-Q injection um, daily. So um, slightly different mode of administration um, and also frequency. Before we go on to speak about the other type of immunotherapy and get into some clinical trial information, I think it is important to recognize our MG scales that we use to assess treatment efficacy. So the MG ADL scale or MG um, activities of daily living scale, the QMG or quantitative myasthenia gravis score, MG composite scale, and MG QOL or myasthenia gravis quality of life questionnaire. These scales are administered uh, during the patient visit um, and are used also during the, our clinical trials that we'll be talking about shortly. Talking a little bit about our neonatal FC receptor antagonists um, and their mechanism. So this is a great picture of, of how they work. Um, the normal mechanism in absence of drug is on the left-hand side of the slide. So you'll see IgG antibodies that, are, that enter the lysosome and then um, our, the, the FC receptor on the IgG is, um, is attached to by the FCRN, and that attachment prevents the IgG from um, being degraded in the lysosome, so therefore it can be released by the lysosome back out into the body and potentiate more Mg symptoms. 
However, whenever we introduce drugs, so this is gonna be on the right-hand side of the slide, um, the drug acts as a ligand binding to the FCRN, so it prevents the FCRN from binding to the IgG and therefore causes IgG degradation within the lysosome and it cannot be re-released um, so, and therefore preventing or, or preventing the potentiation of MG symptoms. FCRN uh, recycles IgG normally, as we just discussed on the previous slide, and it extends its half-life by about four times compared to that of other immunoglobulins that are not recycled, um, so meaning IgG, or sorry, IgM and IgA, uh, perpetuating the availability of IgG autoantibodies. The efficacy of plasma exchange and immunoadsorption demonstrates the utility of removing these autoantibodies in MG management, but these treatments do have limited availability, mostly because of their administration. FCRN antagonists target the IgG autoantibodies that are central to our myasthenia gravis uh, pathophysiology, and they have greater selectivity compared to our conventional MG treatments. So the acetylcholine esterase inhibitors, our corticosteroids, um, and our other uh, steroid sparing um, agents that I mentioned previously. So I'm going to hand it back to Dr. Howard to talk about uh, one of our FCRN antagonists. Thank you, Stephanie. <clears throat> We're gonna talk about Fgartigamod, which is the first in class FCR inhibitor developed. It was approved um, in December uh, of last year. And its current indications are for those patients with generalized myasthenia who have antibodies to the acetylcholine receptor. Uh, as Stephanie said, it antagonizes FCRN, and the FCRN is a salvage pathway, and so we're blocking that recycling uh, process and accelerating the degradation of these uh, IgG molecules as well as antibodies. The dosing and infusion is shown here. It's 10 milligrams uh, weekly for four consecutive weeks, um, and then the individual is observed uh, for their uh, response, and we'll come back and speak about that. There are some adverse events, um, most commonly headache, mild, often not treated, um, a tension-like headache, um, some nasopharyngitis, some diarrhea, all of which were mild and not that much different than the placebo arm. And so we designed the study, a phase three study, to uh, look at this um, in a very large population. And this trial was actually very unique and first in two ways. One, uh, it was allowed to have 20% of the population not have antibodies to the acetylcholine receptor. To date, every trial we did has only been limited to patients with a CHR positive antibody, and that was problematic for a large segment of patients who have the disease. They had to have generalized disease, as we said, mild, moderate, or severe, class two, three, or four. And they had to have this activities of daily living score, which is an eight item questionnaire that's algorithmically uh, queried of the patient, uh, but the patient reports their perception of at least five, and they had to be on stable therapy. Uh, there were selected exclusion criteria that we will let you read for yourself, and then they were randomized one to one um, and observed over the course of the study. The primary outcome measure uh, was a change in the ADL score, and the FDA mandates the ADL score as the primary endpoint in all phase three studies. So we have no choice in, in what we choose. Um, because it's a PRO, it has noise in it, um, but be that as it may, that's what had to be used. So we said, let's strengthen the response and rather just looking for a change from start to baseline to uh, a time point. Let's say we want them to have a two point change. They had to maintain that for at least four consecutive weeks and their onset of improvement had to occur within one week of their last or their fourth infusion. We called that an EDL responder. Uh, and in doing so, nearly 70% of the patients achieved that uh, versus about 30% of the placebo. And in MG trials, placebo responses are our bane. Uh, they've been as high as 62% in some trials. Um, but despite that, we showed that it was highly significant. Um, 
This graphic here shows what happens to the IgG level uh, in green and the antibody level in blue. The two top lines represent the placebo arm. And one sees a very rapid parallel drop in both immunoglobulin level as well as antibody level that reaches its nadir at week four, which was one week after their fourth infusion, and then slowly returns uh, back towards baseline. If we superimpose the ADL score on this, it would follow a very similar pattern down to week four, and then it would diverge and have a slower rise back towards baseline. We noted that there's about 61% reduction in immunoglobulin, 58% reduction in the antibody. So very efficient in clearing uh, of both. Uh, it takes out all IgG subgroups, one, two, three, and four. This is important. Uh, ACHR patients are IgG one and three. Musk myasthenia is predominantly IgG four. And many of our treatments don't work in musk, but this one theoretically should. Uh, their population who did not have ACHR antibody performed very similarly to the total population and actually the ACHR population. We presented this data uh, 10 days ago in, in Nashville. <clears throat> the problem in, in our inability to get a labeling for the negative population was that the placebo arm of the negative population had a much more robust response than the overall placebo and so it negated any statistical significance for the FDA. Critically, we do not change albumin. There is also a binding site for albumin in, uh, in, with FCRN, and some products will reduce uh, albumin to varying degrees, uh, and this product does not do that, and it doesn't change other immunoglobulin molecules. And so this is the primary response that I just showed you. Unlike azathioprine, which takes uh, nearly a year to start working, three years for full effect, and other drugs four to six months in all, this works quickly within two weeks, and 84% did so within the first two weeks of administration. We've seen responses within a single dose, uh, so much faster than any of our other tools. Um, and the QMG, which is a physical exam measurement, uh, much more stringent, uh, had very similar responses, smaller placebo arm, because it's not a PRO in the noise that's, that's introduced. So ADL, improvement in function, QMG in terms of strength. What was also interesting is that patients said, we want to be free. We don't want to be treated continuously. We want to be treated when we need to be treated. And so this is why we went to a cycle approach and we treated for four weeks and then we observed. If they had no response after eight weeks, we could retreat them. If they did respond, we had to wait for their ADL score to come back uh, to within two points of their pretreatment score before we would uh, retreat them. This is a, a study design characteristics, not necessarily what we do in real world. But interestingly, look what happens. Um, more than half the patients have durability of in excess of eight weeks, more than a third in excess of uh, three months. My longest was 46 weeks uh, and then required retreatment. Yes, some had short duration, four to six weeks, about 11%. Um, and uh, there was a third that was in the middle. And so this may be the start of precision medicine that we can treat when we have to treat not on an ongoing continuous basis. When we repeat this over time with multiple cycles, one sees that uh, the curves overlap. So we're continually clearing, have the capability of repeatedly removing similar degrees uh, of IgG as well as antibody. And this one demonstrates the antibody score both to the ADL and the QMG. And this has been the theme that we've observed through the open label extension. So the ADAPT study or the open label was a three-year extension program and it was those who finished. And as testimony, 91% of the patients rolled over. Um, and clinical improvements mirrored what we found in all cycles as I just showed you uh, and also to the blinded portion. Uh, again, well tolerated. No safety signals were seen 
and in the open label, the AE event profiles were uh, essentially identical. Again, minor headache, mild to moderate, nasopharyngitis, and diarrhea, uh, all of which were relatively tolerable. And we perceive that on average, patients will require about five cycles over time. Some more, seven, some one cycle. Uh, so again, maybe an insight into the precision medicine concept that people uh, speak about. And this just lists the safety profile um, that, uh, uh, that I've already explained. The most common ones are listed uh, at the bottom. And it's interesting if you look at the next to the, the column, just to the left of the last column, uh, which is the extension trial, so much longer time period, one sees that the actual incident rates per year are less than during the blinded phase and with placebo. We have a subcutaneous formulation. We did a non-inferiority study. This data was presented again last week at the myasthenia gravis meeting. And the key was to show that it worked the same as the uh, intravenous formulation. And so patients took uh, weekly subcutaneous injections into their abdomen for four consecutive weeks, and then uh, they were followed, and the results were uh, virtually identical to what we saw with the intravenous formulation. Um, and the efficacy was, uh, was shown that it was not inferior to the uh, uh, to the intravenous preparation. There are other FCRN antagonists. Uh, Rosanazixamab, which is UCB's product, uh, has completed its phase three trial. It's go to the FDA this year. Uh, that data was also presented in May, partially, uh, at the International MG meeting, and again last week uh, in Nashville, and uh, with very similar reductions in immunoglobulin level as well as antibody level. They're using a sub-Q uh, weekly uh, infusion or injection. Their AE profiles or injection site reactions as one would expect with many subcutaneous uh, uh, products. And they also had headaches as their primary uh, concern. Um, their inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria are here. Their inclusion criteria were different. And so we can't compare one to one because the study populations are different, uh, which is a real problem in the business, so to speak. Um, but on par, uh, very similar uh, responses, we think, and we need to see what happens with the repeatability, uh, long duration therapy, and what the AE profiles will uh, emerge over time. This is the graphic demonstrating their drop in, uh, in IgG and ACHR on the right. They're looking at two doses, seven milligrams per kilo and 10 milligrams per kilo. Their adverse event profile was slightly greater in those getting the higher dose. And we don't know yet what dose they will choose uh, to market uh, yet, um, but similar, slightly bigger drops in the, the levels than we saw with fgart tigamod Is that important from a clinical perspective? We don't know. Uh, there won't be a head-to-head -head study uh, given the cost of doing these kinds of research studies. Their open label extension is, uh, is ongoing. I don't expect that to be completed for another year. And we'll just have to wait and see. There are others in the market. There's at least three other uh, FCRN trials that are in phase two, or just starting phase three uh, at this point in time. And I have no data to, to report to you about those. So we're going to now start to talk about individualizing uh, these novel therapeutics and, and what are the appropriate treatment uh, strategies. And the goals are to look at an appropriate treatment plan what are the practical considerations versus continuous versus individualized dosing? I'm not sure those are the right words to use, um, but it'll work itself out. And then what's the impact of using FCRN, uh, the first one, which has now been on the market for several months in terms of our clinical care. 
And so let's continue with this case. And you've already, and the faded is what we've talked about, but because he had persistent weakness, uh, cyclosporin was added to his program, five mg per kg, uh, twice daily, uh, 12 hours apart, um, and was treated that way for three years. But because of persistent weakness, um, mycophenolate was added in lieu of his azathioprine. Um, and the azathioprine was abandoned. Remember we said it takes about a year, year plus to start working three years for maximum effect with azathioprine and he got a fair shake and uh, so he was taken off uh, and went with mycophenolate. One can already see the treatment burden and so as we look at how long we're willing to treat a patient before we either pull the plug and add a second agent or simply add a second agent uh, is years. And if this fails one, fails two, fails number three, look how much life this individual has lost uh, with persistent weakness. And so that's one of the issues we face in terms of the quality of life aspect of this disease. People should not have to uh, give up their life and persist with weakness uh, because we haven't found a therapy uh, that's worked. Our biggest issue is that we don't have a good biomarker. And until such time we do, um, we sort of have to do this try, repeat, try, repeat sort of thing. He had been on plasma exchange intermittently as a boost therapy because of the degree of weakness that he had. And then in 2020, he got switched to intravenous immunoglobulin uh, quarterly because plasma exchange was very limited in its effect. He had some response, but it wasn't a, a wow me moment. And then IVIG was complicated by the development of the transient ischemic attack and a DVT. So let's go in and let's talk about practical applications uh, of this. Um, and who was doing this part? Amy. <laughs> Me. Thank you. So vaccination is always hard. And of course, in light of COVID, we're certainly looking at that. But when we look at vaccination considerations in patients with FCRN inhib inhibition, um, it's interesting to see what the studies have shown so far. In FCRN naive patients, recombinant or inactive vaccines should be up to date two to four weeks before initiation of treatment and allowing for the adaptive immunity to develop. Live attenuated vaccines must be used with caution in immunosuppressed patients. Um, when they looked at the studies, uh, there were 80% uh, of the patient population that they studied did have a vaccine response, but it was somewhat muted. The 20% that did not respond, uh, there were a portion of those patients that were on mycophenolate, and others were on therapies such as rituximab or others within that class. Um, so Dr. Howard had said, when in doubt, vaccinate, but within these specific uh, timeline guidelines to ensure uh, that we're covering them appropriately. Patients that are already receiving an FCRN inhibitor, no evidence against administering recombinant or inactivated vaccines has been found to date. Um, and the timing should be to administer the vaccines greater than two months after the last dose and greater than two to four weeks before the next dose. Practical considerations of use. Individualizing the timeline regarding the frequency of treatment cycle, uh, to Dr. Howard's point, uh, customizing or creating a um, an individual treatment plan based on the response of the patient to the therapy, post-infusion monitoring, and longer-term assessment of treatment efficacy, monitoring for and management of the adverse events of treatment. Um, and certainly when we talk about integrated roles and responsibilities of the members of the treatment team, um, we want to make sure that the patient is speaking with all members, so that could be a neurologist, their infusion nurse, their pharmacist. Um, and we thought it was really interesting, and we're just even talking about this earlier, kind of what sort of healthcare practitioners do patients see? Do they see a neurologist or a general primary care health practitioner or some other sort of practitioner um, in order to manage their myasthenia gravis? And 
you know, less than half of those patients actually see a neurologist. So we were kind of surprised, um, but also that just speaks to how important it is to really make sure um, that all members of the healthcare team are communicating, um, not only with each other, but also with the patient. So we're both coming at this, or we're all coming at this from different places in terms of where we treat the patients. Um, my space is ambulatory infusion suites and home whereas Dr. Hi Dr. Iyer and Dr. Howard are treating within a center. So it's going to depend on the therapy that we choose. Um, we're gonna be looking, of course, at the first dose safety considerations. Um, if this is going to be one of the subcutaneous therapies that is coming to market, are they self-administering it? Are they coming into a clinic to have that administered? Or is it a nurse-administered IV therapy? Um, so, of course, we're going to look at IV access. That helps uh, the clinical team make the determination of the direction to go initially with therapy uh, to see if it is appropriate for a peripheral IV to be used or if we need to look at other line options, uh, looking at the routes based on the therapies that are currently available and those that we know are coming. Um, is premedication needed? Uh, as we know in trials, premeds are typically not used, uh, but based on the, the patient's history to previous therapies, they, it, they may be appropriate for premedication. Um, are there rate considerations for the particular therapy that is chosen, dose and volume, which can affect the comorbidities uh, for those patients, for instance, renal insufficiency? What are our anaphylaxis management protocols uh, for nurse or clinician-administered therapies? We're going to use epinephrine, likely diphenhydramine, and make sure that we don't have cardiopulmonary collapse with some form of hydration running, whereas a patient that's administering the therapy will have an auto injector of epinephrine. Um, and then uh, pain management for venous access is something that is quite a buzz. We want to make sure that we don't have therapy treatment avoidance. So we treat uh, the patient from a pain perspective to make sure that the IV start is not an issue for them. For naive patients and first doses, uh, for allergy and anaphylaxis protocols, what are your, an your organizational policies? Do you send a kit for everything? Uh, kit means typically that the nurse is drawing up the epinephrine, which can be challenging depending on the degree of anaphylactic reaction. For a patient that's administering, you'll very often see that the epinephrine two-pack, which is how it comes, is ordered from the retail pharmacy for the patient to pick up before the pharmacy delivers or ships the specialty product. So we need to make sure that that is in place before we are administering the therapy in a non-controlled setting. When we look at site of care and first dose considerations uh, to determine if the patient needs to come into a controlled site or can go into an alternate site of care, such as an AIS or home, we want to look at their geography, the uh, availability of 911 or EMS, caregiver support. There should typically be an adult in the home that is uh, capable of supporting the patient in the event that 911 needs to be called while the nurse is either managing the event or the nurse has already left the home the age of the patient, who is their legal caregiver and guardian, history with IG therapy in the past, if they've had it, uh, that helps us identify responses to other biologics sometimes. Um, if we're doing brand or class changes, are those considered first doses? Where do those first doses need to occur? Uh, route, of route of administration, do we need to add additional hydration based on the therapy of choice? The risks associated with that therapy chosen uh, in terms of first dosing and or ongoing risks such as rituximab, we know that there is the potential for reaction with, um, with any dose, not necessarily just the first. And if there is a uh, patient-administered therapy or if the patient is responsible for coming into the center to be infused, do we um, know that they're going to be adherent with keeping appointments and or self-administering? So on infusion day, I think no matter where you are getting your infusion, if it is IV therapy, we want to make sure that we know what our anaphylaxis management process is going to be. Uh, we want to know that the vital signs can allow us to proceed. Is this patient a hypertensive patient? Do they have an active infection? Um, are the supplies and medication that would be needed present for the start of the IV or the port? 
and the medication uh, to administer it. Is this a pump administered therapy that requires titration or careful rate control? And is it functional? Does the nurse know how to use it? Um, and then once we know those four things have been verified, then we can start the IV um, and begin the preparation of the medication and pre-medicate the patient. If we can't move forward with the first four things, very often the patient can't safely get the medication. Um, and then we are going to prepare the meds based on what is necessary, uh, reconstitution, uh, dilution, pooling, whatever is necessary for that particular therapy, and we can go ahead and administer. When we look at vital sign monitoring, of course, we're always gonna get a baseline, and that's one of the first things we do before we start the IV or manipulate the medication. We will monitor those vital signs per the organizational policy and or the recommendations by the package insert from the manufacturer. And then if this is a therapy that requires post-infusion monitoring, um, as Fgartigama does, um, it would be a one hour post-infusion or as recommended by the manufacturer, and that would include vital signs to ensure that there are no delayed reactions occurring. Patient education. Uh, this is a collaborative approach between pharmacy, nursing, and the prescriber. We want to make sure that they understand what the warnings and precautions are and what they're looking for, both while they're getting the treatment and once they leave the, treat the site of treatment or the nurse leaves. Do they need hydration? Are they getting a treatment where ensuring that they are well hydrated ensure, helps us mitigate any of those side effects that they may experience during the infusion or after? If they're getting the medication delivered to their home, do they know that it's uh, either room temperature or stored in the refrigerator? Um, educating on the importance of dosing as prescribed and adherence. If they're getting a sharps container and they're in the home, uh, that they know how to safely store that away from children and animals and when to dispose of it and how. And I think this is probably one of the most important things here. It's who to call and when to call. When do you call 911? When do you call your pharmacy and or nurse? And when do you call your prescriber? And I'm gonna let Dr. Iyer speak to this, but this is a responsibility of any clinician that is administering medication and uh, extraordinarily important in helping us understand post-marketing or after a drug has been approved, the types of reactions that we're seeing and the prevalence with which they happen. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I agree. It's definitely um, an extremely important part of patient care. Um, and so I would certainly encourage, when, when we talk about reporting any sort of adverse drug reactions, I would encourage a patient to let any member of their healthcare team know that they're having some sort of adverse reaction, either during their treatment, if it's an IV infusion after their treatment, even if it's 48 hours after, because we do know that infusion-related reactions can happen up to 48 hours after the administration of the medication. So certainly following um, your organizational policy, that's always important. Um, but then also looking at any sort of product-specific contact information, um, contacting the FDA, or filling out a MedWatch report. Um, I even have pharmacy students and pharmacy residents that are on rotation with me go through this process whenever we do get an adverse reaction um, notification, because I think it's important for every member of the team to know how to do that and how to, how to fill out those forms. Um, th those forms are also important for quality improvement and like post-marketing um, that any sort of manufacturers do so that way it can be reported and um, also uh, synthesized and um, correlated to be able to spread that knowledge um, to future providers, future patients, and future healthcare team members. Uh, so whenever we talk about adverse drug reactions, you want to make sure to collect as much information as possible. So that could be the rate of the infusion, uh, the time of infusion, the dose, of course, um, the amount that was administered. So maybe they only got a portion of the dose. How much did they receive or how much was remaining of that medication? The lot and expiration. So that way that can be tracked, especially back to the distributor um, and the vial that was actually being used to infuse. Um, so in summary, um, conventional myasthenia gravis treatments are broadly immunosuppressive. So they're not fully affected um, and are effective and they are associated with some adverse effects. Um, so that can leave patients with unmet needs. 
Advancing understanding of our myasthenia gravis pathogenesis allows for the development of these novel strategies, such as FCRN modulators, which can reduce levels of autoreactive IgG antibodies via different mechanisms, um, and that can offer more options for our patients to reach their treatment goals. Fgartigamod is currently the only FDA-approved FCRN treatment, um, but remember that rosanolizumab has completed its phase three trials. So I think now we're going to move on to our question and answer. I'm going to yep. pass it back to Dr. Howard to moderate that. <clears throat> so the first question, or one of the questions that we have is, what are the criteria to put somebody on one of these newer novel therapies? And I think there's no question that the patient who has failed everything, who's had a very, very poor response, um, is a potential uh, patient to receive either a complement inhibitor or an FCRN inhibitor, depending upon what the nuances are uh, at the time. Um, which do you choose among the two can be difficult. Um, I think the elephant in the room is cost. And some of these drugs approach a million a year, less than three quarters of a million a year. Some of theirs are 200,000, others are 400,000. Uh, and it's not only for myasthenia, it's for everything else. Go to SMA and your drug costs are half to a million dollars a year. So biological therapy is costly. Yet no one takes into consideration what is the societal cost of leaving your patient as they are. How much lost time from work? <clears throat> How much time does the significant other or their caregiver have to take off from work? to deal with the patient themselves? Um, what's the lost time in terms of one's own enjoyment uh, of life? If I spend my entire day, a woman on mycophenolate who was having 20 stools a day became a hermit because she did not dare leave her house um, for fear that she would have an accident among friends or in the car or in some store or whatever. So she would never go out. Um, that's costly, and many of the tools that are used to establish cost of care don't take these things into effect, uh, like the ICER programs that model uh, costs. We know the cost of hospitalization, drug, etc., but not these other factors. And so all of this has to go into the formula, and then you can help make a change. Um, Another question that's been sent is, when they need to be treated again, is it one dose or four doses again? And you're, I assume they're referring to Fgartigamod, and that's prescribed in four dose cycles. Um, now, what's happening in the real world may be different. Um, we have a trial going where we're looking at every two week dosing to see if that offers anything different. Um, I think as a neurologist, I treat when the patient has weakness. I don't want them having peaks and valleys. I don't even like rolling hills. I wanna get them into their best clinical state possible and keep them there. And if there's any hint that they're going to break out of that, then I'm going to treat. Now, many payers and the product insert says there is a limited or there's a specific time period between doses four weeks after the last dose before you can administer another. Um, and so that is placed on us. And there are some patients that have a shorter duration and could be treated earlier and ultimately may well be treated earlier as we gain experience. Um, but then there are others that go for months and don't need another treatment. But the goal is to keep them uh, in good stead. But there is one question we're gonna answer and you had a question earlier. So we're, we're looking at those patients that are currently on IVIG being moved to Fgartigamod, why would you choose rituximab versus immunoglobulin therapy versus Fgartigamod for your patient population? Yeah, so I think it becomes a personal choice. I don't like IVIG because of the duration of infusion, um, because of the adverse event profile, predominantly headaches that occur, some of which are the worst headaches of their life, migraine-like headache. Um, and then there are those individuals who do not get a good benefit from it. Uh, I don't like rituximab. 
my own personal experience with rituximab is that it does not work well in ACHR positive myasthenia. It's my drug of choice in musk myasthenia. Uh, and I think it works well with IgG4 mediated disease. And I think it's because it's not targeting the right subpopulation uh, of the B cell. And there are newer things in, the, in trial right now that extend from CD19 targeting to CD20 that may be better. Um, I would readily change someone over to eftartigamot. Uh, the infusion duration is much shorter. Uh, the adverse event profile is much narrower. Um, and then you had a, a reason why the volume the volume mm -hmm. uh, is much less. It's 30 uh, minutes, correct? 30 to 60 minutes, yeah. And we're finding patients uh, in the trial uh, tolerating, we're begging to go after 10 minutes, but because of protocol, they had to stay. But they felt great. They say, is this water? Um, and same with other complement inhibitors. They, the AE profile is just excellent for both classes of drugs. Um, I will go back to say if we're using a complement inhibitor, you must vaccinate the patient against Neisseria meningitis. Complement increases the risk of an encapsulated bacteria. Meningococcal meningitis is the most severe. Neisseria gonorrhea is another one. Uh, so they must be vaccinated by whatever standards are in play. In the US, it's the quadrivalent vaccine plus the B serotype, Pixero or Tremba. Um, in Europe, they don't have the B serotype in some places, so they can only use the quadrivalent. They must be educated in terms of symptoms, and they must carry a wallet card that tells the practitioner what drug they're on with numbers to call if there's any concern. Um, if caught early, meningococcal meningitis is treatable. Uh, if not, it's deadly. Uh, that risk, however, is exceptionally low, very low, but it's not zero. And so we have to approach this in the most conservative fashion for the protection of our patients. So I want to thank all of you for coming. I hope we served a purpose for each of you, whatever that purpose is. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash VZG860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from RGenX US Incorporated.